Um, tonight, Lisa and I are just going to get you started, and then we're going to be um, passing the, the information about how to create a strong application over to our colleagues, Stacey Guliev and um, Dr. Manwei Chu. Lisa, I'll pass it to you now. Thank you. The dog stopped barking right there, and then so I appreciate it. So if you could go to the next slide, Stacey. So welcome everybody. It's great, as Rona mentioned, it's great to see some familiar faces and names here. Uh, just a quick introduction. I'm Lisa Llewellyn. So I'm the manager of the Graduate Programs and Education Office at Workman School of Education, University of Calgary. So it's wonderful to see all of you and joining us. And before we get started with our formal presentation, it's good to get started with, in a good way. And we'd like to just, we would like to acknowledge where we are situated. Uh, some of us are here in the city of Calgary and located on uh, treaty lands. Uh, some of you may not be in Calgary, may not be in Alberta, may not even be in Canada for that. So we just take an opportunity for yourselves to acknowledge the land that you're on while we acknowledge that we are here in the city of Calgary, which is uh, the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta. This includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, which comprise of the Siksika, Bagani, and Gainai First Nations, as well as the Tsitsina First Nations, which, and the Stony Nakoda. And included in the Stony Nakoda are the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation, Alberta Region 3. The city of Calgary and Blackfoot has the name Mohican Sis. So please take the moment to acknowledge where you are and where you are situated. So my name is Stacey Goliath and I'm team lead and graduate program administrator and in the graduate office in Workman School of Education. And um, I'm going to be joined and co-hosting with my colleague, Dr. Mamu Chu, and she'll be talking about different um, aspects of the presentation. So we'll be um, sharing it together. Um, the presentation today is going to be talking about creating a strong application. So we're going to go through, I'll just bring up the slide with the agenda. So we're going to walk through different sections of the application. The first section that I'm going to talk about is the post-secondary education section of the application and the transcripts. Then Manway will speak to the program information, program specific questions, and then I'll talk a bit more about the test scores and referees, and then we'll have a question period. So the first section that I will jump into, the first slide I'll be talking about is post-secondary education and the information that you find in the application. So in the application, the instructions that are shared is the list of post-secondary institutions you must have attended starting with the most recent. You must list all post-secondary education regardless of whether the degree was completed. This includes any short-term enrollment, courses taken for upgrading, transfer credit, and any previous attendance at the University of Calgary. Failure to disclose Closed post-secondary record is a serious matter and may result in disciplinary action. So this is the information that's given to you within this section. Um, questions that often come up for us are around what do each of those terms mean? What does short-term enrollment mean? Courses taken for upgrading and transfer credits so that the applicant can ensure that they're providing all of the necessary information. So in terms of short-term enrollment, that means that it's an institution that was a post-secondary institution that was attended for a short period of time and you withdrew without earning a credential or returning. For courses taken for upgrading, that means you were enrolled in a course, a course at a post-secondary institution, but you were not admitted to a, um, to a program leading to a degree, diploma, or certificate. And questions often arise around if I've taken a professional development course and things like that. So as long as it was a course that you received for, for a credit from a post-secondary institution, then that would be the type of um, uh, institution that you would list under this section. 
And then there's also transfer credits. So transfer credits are university level coursework completed at a recognized slash accredited post-secondary institution for credit towards a credential at another institution. So you've completed your work at one institution and oftentimes that information might be listed on the transcript for the new institution where you completed the degree or received your credential. So once you've listed all of your institutions in the application, a task that's associated with that is submitting your transcripts. So there are two different types of transcripts that can be submitted for different purposes. You have your official transcript and your unofficial transcript. So all applicants must submit an official transcript for all post-secondary institutions listed. Um, for transfer cred credits, as mentioned, even if the transfer credit, um, even if the transfer credit course is listed on the on the transcript for the institution where the degree was awarded, a transcript for the institution where the trans transfer credit was completed still needs to be submitted. So um, it's important, I think, if you're filling out both sections to look at your transcript and see um, where all the information is and what needs to be submitted once you've listed that information in your application. Um, good information to know about the official and unofficial transcript is for the official transcript, the official transcript finalizes your admission. You need to submit one official copy of that transcript and the degree certificate if um, the degree is not clearly stated on the transcript. And that's for domestic, um, in, for domestic students. For international students, you still have to submit your degree certificate as well as your unofficial transcript, um, even if it is clearly stated on um, the transcript. And it must arrive in a sealed and signed um, envelope from the institution you attended. For the unofficial transcript, that is used more for the initial evaluation purposes. So one unofficial transcript can be submitted, but you have to ensure that it includes the grading scale and the transcript legend so that um, an initial evaluation could, um, could, could be processed. One thing to remember is if you are offered admission and you've submitted unofficial transcript, that offer will be conditional upon the receipt of your official transcript slash degree certificate, if that's what's required. And transcripts can be sent to the Faculty of Graduate Studies from the institution, or they can be mailed to you and then you can send them to us, but they must remain in a sealed envelope. Email transcripts must be sent directly from the issuing institution to the institution issuing institutions transcript office to grad transcripts at ucalgary.ca. Okay, I'm gonna pass this over to Manny. Hello everyone, welcome to the season finale of the MED recruitment series. So like any good final chapter, we have to do a bit of a recap. So for those of you who have been with us for the first couple series, you'll know that um, we did go through the three year route to our MED interdisciplinary or the two year route to the MED specialist. And it's important that you know the difference between the two because the first two questions in the program specific question of your application asks you, are you sure this is the program you're in and that you meet all the requirements in terms of making sure you have a certificate before you apply for the diploma, things like that. So when we get into the actual questions, and Stacy can help me get to the next slide, we asked our academic coordinators, what are they looking for once you submit the application to them? So we asked all the academic coordinators this year, and this is what they told us. So for the first question about your, um, your statement, 
It's only 300 words, so you have to be concise and clear. So what you really need to do here, according to the academic coordinators who are going to be adjudicating your applications, they want to know why you, and they want to know how this is going to align with your professional background. So explaining your passion for why these courses and why it, ha it has to be you in these courses make helps us build that story for saying, yeah, of course you need to be here. Of course we need to accept you. They've also made a really important uh, distinction to say, please don't try to cut and paste your application from something else because they notice and to make sure that everything is grammatically all good because these are grad programs. And then if we move on to the next question, or next two questions, because I've lumped them together there. So the, the next two question asks for any academic awards or any professional publications. And even as a teacher, I myself had none because I just don't have publications as a teacher, but that's okay. Because they recommended that this is one of the areas where a lot of teacher applicants may have some weaknesses. So they recommended that even if you have no academic awards, talk about other achievements and honors. So talk about achievements you've received at work or maybe your volunteerism. So maybe you're the coach of a softball team. Maybe at work, you're the team lead of your department so, or anything like that would fit into number four in that section. And if you don't have any professional publications, that's okay. Maybe you've written a newsletter article or anything else like that. So would you put anything that's relevant into those sections to try to not leave it blank is what they're trying to say. And then the next section, number six, they talk about your professional employment. So this question goes hand in hand with the statement of intent question, because in the statement, the adjudicators really wanted to see how this is going to be related to your work. So how does taking these courses, how could it benefit your work? So here, when you're talking about your career and your employment, it's important to talk about how the, your employment history is going to fit with all of the statements that you made in your statement of intent. So if, for example, if you're really hoping to get into leadership, maybe your employment history showcases that you've had opportunities to be a leader in your school. And this is why now you're trying to come back to get a degree or a certificate or diploma. So it should all match together. And then the next one, for your academic organizations and professional organizations, for teachers, most of us are going to be a part of the ATA, but if you're part of something else as well, please definitely let us know. Maybe you're part of a hockey organization. Maybe you're part of the ATA's social studies group. So let us know all of the memberships that you're in because that might help us paint a picture of who you are so that it makes it easier for the adjudicators to score you higher. And then the final question in the program specific questions is this last question here where they say, if there's anything else you want the admissions committee to know, please put it here. But if you have nothing, don't feel obligated to put anything here. But this is an excellent spot to address any elephants in the room as some of them put it. So what they mean is if you have a low GPA, so for example, maybe you did your degree 15 to 20 years, 30 years ago. And the GPA at that time, it just wasn't high enough. It's not 3.0, which is the requirement here. So address it. Maybe you did, maybe you were young and you had fun. That's why your GPA isn't quite as high as you'd like it to be, but you've had so many more experiences now between then and today. So you can talk about how you should take your experience into consideration versus looking at this one number for your GPA. Or maybe your um, history and your work experiences don't match up with what is what you're applying for. So for example, maybe you're just a teacher You've never experienced leadership, but you hope one day to move into leadership. So this is where you could address that, even though your work history doesn't have any experience in leadership, but this is the spot where you think you're going to be. So this is why you want the education to help get you there. So now back to Stacy. Thank you, Ma'am Link. <clears throat> 
And the section that I'm going to talk about now is test scores. So for in the application, for applicants who choose permanent study permits, work permits, refugee or other under citizenship, they are required to enter test score information. The instructions and information that is shared in the application is all official test scores must be submitted to the department to which you are applying directly to by the testing agency. The information you supply below is not considered official, but will assist the department in evaluating your application until the official test score is received. English language proficient. English language proficiency exams must be taken within the last two years to be considered. Um, to be considered. Um, within this section two, you do have the option of choosing not to provide a test score. Um, something to note um, about that is even if you do declare that, the department that you are applying to can ask you for test score information based on their evaluation or if that's um, what's required and needed. Next slide. Um, under test scores, there's also a section for applicants who choose um, citizenship as follows, Canadian, permanent resident, or indicated that you did post a post-secondary degree, um, you obtained it within Canada or the U.S. Um, within those categories, you're not required to provide um, proof of English language proficiency. However, if English is an additional language for you, the program you are applying to may require you to provide evidence of your English language proficiency. So there's always that caveat that exists within there. The next section that I'm going to talk about is referee and references. So an appropriate referee. An appropriate referee is written by an independent individual who can report on your academic uh, ability and qualifications or provide an assessment of your background and capabilities with respect to the prospective program. And um, a reference that isn't considered acceptable is a reference from a friend, family member, colleague, um, people currently registered in a graduate degree program or a general reference that does not speak to or support the application for the particular program that you're applying to. Another question that does come up is the difference between an academic um, reference and a professional reference and how those two are weighted on when one will be required or not required. Um, if you are currently registered in a graduate degree program at the University of Calgary, or if you recently completed a graduate degree program, one reference should come from your program supervisor. Unless you have been out of school for more than four years, at least one of the letters or references, um, or preferably all, should be academic. So that kind of gives you an idea of the parameters around choosing a professional or an academic reference. And then there's another part to a reference is, is also preparing your referee and ways that you can gauge whether you've chosen the correct referee for the program. So um, ensure who you are asking to serve as your reference will first provide a very strong reference. Also, when you are contacting them and you've decided that, also confirm that they're providing you with an active institutional or business email that they check frequently. Because in the application for the references, you have to provide the email address and the reference link is sent directly to the referee and that reference information is sent directly back to the application. So it needs to be an active email that they check frequently. Um, there are different parts of the reference that tend to be weak based on some feedback that we've received. So conversation around discussing um, research potential um, is something if that's particular to your program that you'll want to discuss with your reference and make sure that they have a clear understanding of um, what's required for that section. Also, you can meet and have conversations and brainstorm with your, with your referee and give them ideas and examples of things that you've done and uh, along the way. So that it can help support um, the reference for you. 